are ascending to the Most High God and He receives it because we come not in our own name, not in our own strength, but we come strictly on the basis of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Um, we want to thank you again for joining us. If you have not as yet, please invite someone to join the service. You may want to share a little watch party and invite others to come on board. Today we are starting a brand new study series and it is called Understanding the, and Embracing the Kingdom of God. Let me repeat it again. We are going to be discussing over the next several weeks Understanding and Embracing the Kingdom of God. In the book of, um, of, of John, the Gospel of John chapter 3, the Bible tells us of this Jewish leader who came to Jesus by night and he, he said you are a good teacher he was saying to Jesus we know that you are a teacher that has come from God because unless you have come from God no one could do the things that you are doing and as he was speaking to Jesus Jesus turned and said something very profound to him he said except a man be born again he cannot see or he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. In other words, he lives as a natural man, just going through life, thinking only about today. He may be religious, he may be doing good things, or he could be living crazy, but he does not understand the kingdom of God. So the man got confused and he said, can a person who is old go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, listen, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Today, we will begin delving into the Word of God. For my text, I want to invite you to go with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, not John. We are going to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We are picking up from verse 25. So let's read the text. And then we'll come back and we'll examine it step by step. Um, let's read. <laughs> so I'm reading again from the English Standard Version known as the ESV. I want to encourage those of you who have a smartphone and you're still probably holding on to a traditional paper Bible. That's fine. It's good. But if you want to be a little more versatile and have access to a variety of translations, go to your, um, to your store, your app store, and there type in Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, U-Version Bible app. It is one of the best apps that is out there. Now, I promise you they're not paying me to advertise their product. But I've been using it for over, I think, like 10 years. I've not used the hard copy Bible in that long, but it's very versatile. You have access to a number of translations in all kinds of languages. You version Bible up. So let me get back to the business for which we came. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Just a quick background. In Matthew chapter 5, the very first verse, it tells us that when Jesus saw the multitude, that he went into the mountain and he sat down. And his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying. So from Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 all the way through to the end of chapter 7. Jesus is speaking exclusively to his followers, his disciples. I want to say something else about disciples so you would grasp the enormity of what we are talking about before we delve into the text. A disciple was someone who chose a single master or rabbi to follow. He bought into their teaching, he bought into their lifestyle because what he was going to do was to pattern his or her life after the mind process, the way the master thought and the way the master spoke, he would memorize what the master said or she would memorize what the master said and then they would seek to emulate their lifestyle. Keep that in mind as we delve into the text, right? 
So they choose a single master. They did not run around looking for many masters. Jesus was their only master. Number two, they paid careful attention to the things that he said. Because as they listened to what he was saying, and then they looked at how he lived, they would understand his mindset or his worldview. So now, here is Jesus speaking exclusively to his followers or his disciples. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Therefore, verse 31, now I skip some verses just because it's a lot. You read the full text, but picking up verse 31 now. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Notice, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 34, which is the final verse in the chapter. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I would encourage you, in your spare time, Make time rather. Go back and read Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Don't rush it. Take your time and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what Jesus is saying there. I'm just dealing with one part today. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are what is called the principles or the laws governing the kingdom of God. So when we read the text, whatever we find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 has to do with how God expects his children to live in the world because they are a part of his kingdom. So first of all, we want to talk about Jesus' priority principle. What is the critical thing? Now notice, Jesus is not advocating that one should not be concerned about material things. That's not what he is saying. He is saying that it should not be our topmost priority. So in the text, Jesus is seeking to establish what should be the priority in a follower's life or in a disciple's life. Now I am drawing the conclusion that you who are joining us today and those who would watch this broadcast later on, all of us have made or are in the process of making a commitment to become a disciple or a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying today is quite applicable to you and to me, right? We want to examine what Jesus' priority, the principle is that should govern every one of our lives. First of all, let's talk a little about the Gentile mindset. Jesus is making very clear that the Gentile, and so I need to clarify what we mean by Gentile here. Scripturally, there were historically only two types of people. Number one, there were the Hebrews or the Israelites who were always considered God's covenant people. Why were they God's covenant people? Because they were the descendants of Abraham with whom God had a covenant relationship through his son Isaac, then his son Jacob. They were his covenant people. He redeemed them from bondage in Egypt 
and he entered into a covenant relationship with them at Mount Sinai. That covenant relationship, God gave them specific laws that they were required to adhere to as a part of the covenant agreement. The other people, all the other people upon the face of the earth were considered Gentiles because they did not know the way of God. So when the Bible spoke in that, speaks in that context, it is referring to the people who do not know or follow the way of God. Right? Now today, there are three categories of people for purposes of our discussion. There are still the traditional Hebrew or Israelite people. There are the normal Gentiles who do not have a covenant relationship with God. And then there are the people of God, people from all nations and languages and tongues, people who come out of the traditional Israelite community, people who come out of the Gentile community, doesn't matter what nationality. Now, why are they classified as the people of God? Because they have come into a covenant relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we speak of the Gentile mindset here, we're talking about those who have not come into a covenant relationship with God. So then, Jesus is making clear that there is a distinction between the worldview of the people of God and all the other people. You see, the traditional Israelite, they have a religious worldview. There are many Gentiles who don't have a covenant relationship with God, but they are very religious. They participate in a lot of religious activities. So all of them are classified into that group. There are even people who are called Christians who fall into that religious category. And then there are the people of God, those who have made a commitment to live out a life following the pattern or patterning their lives after the Lord Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that all of us today would be those who are committed to being the people of God. We are patterning or seeking to pattern our lives after the Lord Jesus Christ. So the people who are outside the covenant relationship with God, their focus is primarily on things that they should, what should we eat, what should we drink, what should we wear. Now I, I remember growing up back in Guyana, and I see it over here, there are people who spend money on clothing, they spend money on food, they, they spend money on parties, and, and they look to buy the latest gadget, but they're not concerned about tomorrow. All they're concerned about is impressing people with the externalities. They have a lot of verbosity. They talk plenty. They have a lot of external stuff. They show off a lot of stuff, but they lack substance. They may drive a Mercedes Benz or a BMW or all these other things to impress people. They look for all the expensive cars and they look for all the ex expensive handbags and clothing and the brand name stuff, but they lack substance because they don't have a relationship with God. Those are the Gentiles about whom Jesus is speaking. Um, the unregenerate person is primarily concerned with self-gratification and perhaps even showing compassion to people, but it is all towards getting a claim for themselves. So here is what Jesus said again in Matthew 6.25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, right? What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Don't be concerned with all the externalities. Don't be obsessed with it. Notice why. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You see, so the, the, this is the question. What is it that drives our life's purpose, right? He goes on and he says here in Matthew 4, 4, this is what he said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Our lives, the life of a disciple of Christ, is one that hears what God is saying and we commit ourselves to honoring God. And so when we do that, when we commit ourselves to, being, to honoring God, to being obedient to God, what begins to happen is that our lives come into equilibrium or balance. We are not 
overboard on one side or the other side. Um, they, <laughs> there are people who spend all day praying and they don't want to do anything else. Their life is out of balance. There are people who spend all day reading their Bibles or some religious book. Their life is out of balance. We have to have balance and it is only as we hear the voice of God and we look at life objectively that our lives come into balance. So that is where kingdom, living in the kingdom of God, that is where it takes us. So Jesus' solution then is that we must seek first the kingdom of God. Again, I am saying to you, he is not saying that we must not be concerned about material things. He is saying we must not be obsessed with it. In other words, he is not saying that you must not plan for your retirement. If you are truly a part of the kingdom of God, you will be planning for your retirement. Because God promises that most of us will live three score and ten. What is three score and ten? Seventy. So a lot of us will be living there. And if, if we're going to live that long, obviously you have to make provision for it. But what he is saying is that your focus in life must be honoring God, must be living within the realm of God's kingdom. So let's, let's examine it some more. Um, here's the text again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now notice the end part. And all these things, what are the things that he's talking about? Well, clothing and food and footwear and, and a house and all these things, they will be added as we're seeking God first and he's bringing balance to our lives. We would recognize we have need of those things. Now here's what the Bible says. God already knows that his children need these things. So we don't have to go, oh God, I need a house, oh God, I need a house, oh God, I need a house. Or God, I need food, I need food, I need... You don't have to approach God like that. God is our Father. He is not just the one who spoke this world into being. He is not just the one who sustains or holds the world in its place by the power of His Word. He is our Father. And I will tell you, as a father, my kids don't have to make an appointment to see me. Why? Why? They are my children. Now they may tell me, Daddy, you need to give us notice when you want to do something or something of the sort. That's on them. But as their father, if my son calls me now and he says, Daddy, I have an emergency. Guess what Daddy is doing? Daddy is saying to you, excuse me, my son is calling. I need to take care of my son. That is what a father does. He does not make children and leave them all around the place and doesn't provide for them. A true father is one who makes provision for his children. But the provision is not just material provision. He equips them by helping to shape their worldview. So God is our father. He knows what we need. And he's telling us that our priority has to be his kingdom. Therefore, we need to distinguish between doing religious things and things that please God. See, a lot of people feel that because they do a lot of good stuff and because they do a lot of religious stuff. Now, what, I, what do I mean by religious stuff? Going to church. Now, one of the things we have learned is that while we preach it, that you must go to a physical building and we believe and we advocate that when things are normal, every Christian should find themselves in a place, a house of worship where they come together with other Christians to worship the living God and to be instructed in the word of God, we must understand that what the Bible teaches is that my body is the temple of God. And therefore, wherever I go, God is with me. Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he will guide you into all truth. But not only that, he will be with us and he will be in us. So if God is dwelling in us by his spirit, then it means that we are the temple of God. It's not a physical building made by human hands. 
That means that we must get over this mindset that, oh my, I gotta go to a building, I got. No, you don't have to be in a building. You need to be with the people of God. Right now, we are all in different countries, we are in different states, we're in different locations, in different buildings, but we are still in church because the assembly of God's people are together. And what are we doing? We are worshiping God together. We are studying his word together. We are growing together in the knowledge and the grace of God. So we must distinguish between the religious things like going to a building and, and reading our Bibles and praying. All of those are important things and we need to do them. We must understand that helping the poor and the less fortunate, all of those are important things and by the grace of God we must do them. We must understand that sharing our faith in Jesus with other people, those are all important things. And every disciple, every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ need to be doing those things daily. But if you're doing those things and you don't have a connection with the Lord Jesus Christ, those are just religious practices. You see? Because when someone is in the kingdom, that person works for the glory of the king, not for themselves. In other words, when a, a child of the king does something, he does it not to receive glory for himself. He does it so that his king, his father can receive the glory. His father can be honored. His father can be esteemed so that people would bow before not him or her, but before the Father and say, Father, we worship you for your manifold goodness and grace. So it is erroneous to think that because one does those things that they are pleasing God. What really pleases God is when we have a heart that truly loves him and seeks to do everything to honor him. That there means we are connected to the kingdom of God. So then, what then does the kingdom of God really refer to? So here's what, how I put it. The kingdom of God refers to God's rulership in a specific sphere, in a specific environment. There is a, a sphere. Every king has territories. Every king. So if, if, um, if you take England, for example, the Queen of England, she has a territory that she governs, right? England is a part of that territory. Great Britain, as they would call it, which would involve Scotland and Ireland, all of those become a part of our realm, of our rulership. So then what is the sphere of God's rulership? Um, Matt, um, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, notice, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not just the heaven, but the heavens and the earth. So what then is God's realm? What is God's sphere of rulership? The heavens and the earth. Why? He made them. They all belong to him. Um, Colossians 1.16. Here's what it says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So in essence, what I am saying is God's realm, his sphere of rulership is the entire universe. Hallelujah. Amen. The presidents, all of them, they may not acknowledge him now. They may pay lip service to him now. But the Bible tells us that there is coming a day when every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the honor and glory of God. The Bible tells us for Jesus has received a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus now hear this, every knee in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth bows at the name of Jesus. Men may be lifting their fists in the face of God saying, I am an atheist, I don't believe in God. That is now, but the day is coming 
when all of that will cease and everyone will bow their knees before him and acknowledge him as Lord, as, rule, as, as ruler, as master, as king. Those of us who are smart, we choose to do it now. Hallelujah. So then, here's the thing. Jesus came to restore man to his place of dominion on the earth. That was his primary purpose. When we speak of the redemptive work, when we speak of salvation, a lot of people only limit it to the issue of sin. That is just a minor part of why Jesus came. What Jesus came to do, now notice my choice of words, he came to restore, to put back those who come into covenant relationship with him to their rightful place of dominion or rulership over the earth. Now why am I saying he came to do that? Well, Jesus had assigned man, when God created man in Genesis 1, what God did is that God gave man dominion over the earth. He gave him rulership over the earth. In Genesis 3, we read that Adam surrendered that rulership to Satan. That is why Satan has dominion over the earth and the earth is so messed up because Satan is messed up and he's trying to mess up everyone's life. But the people who are the people of God, those who are seeking, those who have come into covenant relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, they are the ones who are being restored. Now hear me, they are being restored to the position of dominion over the earth. Um, God's, God, we are God's agents chosen in Christ and being equipped by the Holy Spirit to manage God's affairs here on the earth. That is why Jesus said, listen, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city that is set upon a hill. He is saying that as a child of God who has dominion and authority to represent God here upon the earth, your life is light that illuminates everything around you and it dispels the darkness because that's what light does. Light always dispels darkness. It doesn't matter how dark it is. Just a speck of light comes in. Wherever that light goes, it dispels the darkness. Darkness can never stand in the presence of light. And so because we are in Christ, we are coming increasingly to this place as we submit to the Holy Spirit where the light of Christ in us is beginning to radiate out and affect all of those who are in our midst. Now, each of us has our assigned sphere where we are to exercise dominion on God's behalf. Do you know where we start with ourselves? We start the dominion with ourselves. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, the man that lacks control over his, himself, his own spirit, is like a city that has no walls. Think about that. If you lack self-control, if I lack self-control, I am like a city that has no, in other words, I have no defense. As soon, um, we, we used to say back in Guyana, as soon as anything comes, knock, you got to run in behind it. As soon as somebody presses a button, you jump in response. But you see, a child of God who is beginning to grow and to mature, the first place that they learn to exercise dominion is over themselves by the power of the indwelling spirit. The first place. Dominion number one has to do with self. Dominion number two has to do with your own home, your sphere. That's your sphere of rulership, of dominion where we have to learn and submitting to the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about being domineering. I am talking about leading by example, influencing how your family goes. Because as we submit to the Holy Spirit, we don't need to bully other people. We don't need to cajole them. As the Holy Spirit is working in our lives and we're beginning to conform to the image of Christ, meaning more and more of the rulership of God is being established in our lives, what begins to happen, we become calm, we are not reactive, but we respond. What's the difference between being reactive and responding? Well, a reactive person is one who acts on impulse, 
as soon as somebody says something, they, they, their amygdala kick in, and they gotta say something. There, there, there is no measured response. They are not thinking strategically as to how do I deal in this situation. And so your boss says something. I, I'll never forget this this incident. A young man some years ago was working at Walmart just down the road here from us, and he wanted to be promoted into an area that he was not even qualified for. The boss told him to go into another area, and the dude quit. Reactive. He quit the job because he said, they're not putting me where I want to go. It's not your company. If every time somebody says something or does something that you and I don't like and we have to react and retaliate, we are not growing. A measured response is one that takes into consideration all the parameters. See, a child of God does not react, they respond. And when they respond, they respond in a way that honors and glorifies God. So each of us have our own sphere to which God has assigned us. And if we don't master ourselves, if we don't conquer ourselves through the indwelling spirit of God, we cannot exercise greater dominion. Here is the problem. A lot of us want to exercise dominion or rulership over other people when we have not yet conquered ourselves. And if we are not submitting to God, we cannot conquer ourselves. Therefore, our sphere of influence is limited. Our realm of dominion, our realm of rulership is narrow. But if you want to have greater influence, first submit to the Lord. Come under His authority. Let the Spirit of God first work in you, in me, renewing our minds, changing the way we think. Get rid of this conspiracy theory mindset. We need to cast it out. It is demonic. It's ungodly. What we need is to have what I call a Christological mindset. We need to learn to see the world through Jesus. Through Jesus' eyes. So then, here's what the text says in, in um, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Right? You are already a part of the kingdom. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When it speaks of baptized there, that's not water baptism. It means once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you've been baptized into Christ. And because you've been baptized into Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ now lives in us. And therefore, we have put on Christ. Now, you have to first become aware of it. So then, dominion is exercised through our embracing God's kingdom. Again, what is God's kingdom? It is his sphere of rule. It is a sphere of influence. It is the sphere where he governs. Now, do you remember in the Lord's Prayer, I'll be closing just now for today and we'll pick it up next week. But do you remember in the Lord's Prayer, the first thing Jesus said was, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed or made holy is your name. Right? So the children, the ones who are praying, your prayer really is that by our lifestyle, by the way we think, the way we speak, the way we act, we'll make the Lord's name holy. Right? That's kingdom thinking. He goes on and he says in that same prayer, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Now how is God's will going to be done on earth even as it's done in heaven? The only way that's going to happen is if God's children, you and I, here, the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people of God, if we begin to first of all place ourselves under God's dominion, under God's rule, we will not be rebellious teenagers and little brats. We will stop behaving like that. We are mature children. We are growing in our knowledge and our understanding of who God is and what he demands of his children because we already have his DNA. Therefore, what we will do is stop acting out and we will calm ourselves and go into his school of teaching or tutoring so that we can understand how he thinks and then we will speak and behave accordingly. Listen to the Apostle Paul. 
Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. That's frightening. <laughs> because you can tell whether someone is being matured or immature by what comes out of their mouth. Some of us need to zip it, right? You learn whether you're matured or immature by what comes out of your mouth, what you see. What we see is indicative of the way we think. For the Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the lab, the seat of reasoning, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Bible further says, for a man or a woman is ensnared or trapped by what? The words that come from their mouth. How many of us have gotten into so much trouble because we like talk, talk, talk? Here's what Watchman Nee said. Watchman Nee said that idle words leak life. That is a profound statement. In his book, Practical Issues of This Life, Watchman Nee wrote, Idle words, people who like to just chat and talk and talk endlessly, always yapping and going on. He said, those who speak idle things, they leak their spiritual life so that they have no substance to offer when the time comes. So back to Paul. Paul said, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child because what? I thought like one. But when I became a man, I put away childish behavior. How do we know that someone is mature? By how they live. I want to say that again. How do we know that someone is mature by the way they live? Because a mature man puts away childish behaviors. They get rid of their big boy's toys. They get rid of their emotional reactions. They get rid of all this verbosity and all these crazy things because they recognize that it is no longer about themselves but they are now a part of God's kingdom. And as they understand God's kingdom more and more, they begin to calm themselves and they begin to live lives that are based on their design purpose. Their design purpose, not just based on their emotions and what's going on in society and culture. Remember I used the term last week, cultivate. You remember I used that term, cultivate. If you're going to cultivate, if I'm going to cultivate, we have to change our environment. We cannot change our environment if we keep thinking like the Gentiles think. In other words, we cannot change the environment, we cannot exercise dominion if we keep thinking like the people amongst whom we live. The first thing we have to do is learn to understand the way God wants us to think and begin to think that way. So here's what Paul said in Ephesians. He said we must capture every thought, every high thought, every imagination, and we must bring it into captivity to what? The knowledge of Christ. So then the one who is beginning to come into the kingdom of God, and we'll talk a lot more about this over the next few weeks, the one who is beginning to come into the kingdom of God begins to recognize that, you know what? I am not where I need to be. There is so much more that God has in store for me. But to, to get there, I have to first of all embrace his rule and his reign in my life. The first place where dominion has to begin is in my own mind. And that is why this ministry has the name Renew and Transform. Why? Romans 12, 2 says it. Do not pattern your lives after this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. When our minds are renewed, that's when we begin to come into kingdom living. And it is only when you come into kingdom living that you find out something. The king is the one who provides all the resources and all the protection. But we'll talk more about that next week. For today understand that all the realms that you can think about belong to God. And here on the earth, God has assigned you and I to exercise dominion 
in his place as his representatives, as his children, as his people, he wants to rule the earth through us. But first of all, for God to rule the earth through us, we have to first of all come under his dominion, under his rulership. That means we have to stop acting out like little teenagers and little brats. We are no longer one and two and three year old or five year or six year old or in our teens. We are not even young adults. We are supposed to be immaturing people now, not immature, but immaturing people of God. And the only way that happens is if we first of all calm ourselves and go before the Lord and say, Lord, teach me. Holy Spirit, teach me. And you will find that he sends people into your life who is already walking that path and he encourages you to partner with them. Now, one more word of caution before we close today. You have to learn to close ranks because the enemy is a master strategist. He would use little things, little words, little actions to say, you know what, this person, conspiracy theory, this person is doing that and that person is doing that and they are not, and we become judgmental of each other and division comes in. And the moment we go in that direction, we are going to be isolated so that the devil can knock us down. We become embittered, we walk away from the faith, and we enter into a very destructive life. There are many Christians today going to church faithfully, but they are living lives of rebellion. They are not walking as a part of the kingdom, even though they can see it, they are not a part of the kingdom because they are in active rebellion against God. And God is calling on me, He's calling on each of you who are watching today and all those who would watch this study later that we have to first and foremost place ourselves under the authority of God. Understanding and embracing the kingdom of God, the introduction. Next week we'll begin delving into deeper stuff as it pertains to the kingdom of God. So let me just go to this slide and then we will pray. See how much more stuff I had for you? But we're not in a rush. So just for today, our assignment. Understand that you're God's child. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you are God's child. Receive that adoption. Right? Begin to see yourself as a child of God. Not what other people say about you. That you're a child of God. Right? Discover what it means to be this child of God. And then begin, ask the Holy Spirit to begin to help you to live like that. Let's pray, please. Father and God, today in Jesus' name, thank you. We, we feel the sweet presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And right now, Spirit of God, I sense that you're moving through the airwaves. You're moving through the internet and you're touching the hearts and the lives of all those who are in this study with us at this moment. And God, we pray in Jesus' name that even as you're touching, you're bringing conviction, you're bringing correction, you're bringing enlightenment. We ask in Jesus' name, God, that even as we close the broadcast itself, that your spirit would continue to work in each and every one of our hearts. And God, that you would open our eyes to see those areas of our lives, God, where we are merely religious rather than walking as children of God in relationship to you, submitted to you. And so, God, we pray for your help today in Jesus' name. God, we take authority over the spirit of, of deception because that is the weapon that the enemy uses the most against your church, the spirit of deception. Open our eyes, God, so that we would see and not be deceived. Give us ears to hear and give us hearts that would respond in obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So thank you again for joining us today, family and friends. We really pray that the, the word of God is beginning to challenge you more and more deeply that you would examine yourselves more critically as I have to do every day for myself before God. Let the Spirit of God really stir these things up. Forget your religion. Forget all the things that you were taught. Ask God, God, is this what you're really saying to me now? How do I respond? How, how do I respond in relation to what you're saying? What are the changes? Like a good friend of mine said to me one time, I know who I am. But what's going to happen to me as I begin to surrender to God? He is discovering that better and better things are happening even as he faces ongoing challenges. Why? Because God never takes from us 
something that is negative and never gives us something better. He always gives us better. When he asks us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he's offering us better. All the other stuff that the Gentiles seek after, God adds it. It's an addendum because the real rich is, is in knowing, the real treasure is in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us again today. My name is Ian Taylor. Um, we serve in Renew and Transform Ministries International. It's a joy and a pleasure having you with us today. Um, we want to encourage you to pray with us. Keep joining us in the studies. Invite others to join us to look at some of the teachings that are there. And come on, join us again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Where is it? So we'll be looking at the church in Laodicea. And we'll be, we're, that's in Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and uh, through 22. And then next Sunday at 9 a.m., Understanding and Embracing the Kingdom of God, part 2. We'll pick up from where we left off. It's only going to get better. In the meanwhile, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance and be gracious unto you. May he watch over you and give you his peace in Jesus' name. And so in Hebrew we say, Shalom. Shalom. Right? Lord be with you. Bye now. <laughs>